And it's what we're going to be talking about tonight. It's what we talk about here in Knoxville. We don't have selling speakers come into Knoxville the way that a lot of groups do. And it's not that I disagree or um, I'm less uh, condescending of, of selling speakers than I used to be, quite seriously, because I've been to a number of sem seminars now. There's a lot of fantastic information that's provided. But what happens is what I want is not to sell you a program to get you to move quickly. I want you to learn on your own and build your own strength. Learn how to create your own foundation of information. And once you've got that foundation in place, everything else becomes easy in the real estate business. We don't want to, there's no reason talking in terms of 1031 exchanges and delayed 1031 exchanges and re reverse 1031 exchanges. What we want to talk in terms of is buying and selling understanding margins and how to have conversations that are the substance of real estate. Not touching on the high points, but actually the real substance of real estate. Last, last month, we talked about the fundamentals of money. And these three seminars are started because of the, I, I, I attended in Nashville the Alan Cowgill uh, and Andy Heller presentation. And it was a packed house, there were 90 people in the room, maybe 100. And they sold um, CDs packet, CD packages uh, where you could buy a package of information for let's say call it $1,800 and you could learn to get private money or you could learn to go after bank REO properties and it's again it's not that that information isn't valuable it's that most investors the analogy that I use is that that's like starting at the second story of a building and you don't really have the foundation to use it you may be there, but how you got there, you're not sure and what you, whether you're going up or down is going to require a lot more effort. And so what we want to talk about tonight is the private money side. Next month we're going to talk about and follow up with um, on money, money, money. But the third phase of it is when is enough enough? When do you stop asking for money? And so next week, next month is, is going to follow up on that and it should be a, a different topic and I hope a lot of fun. But again, what I want everybody to do is be comfortable about interacting and asking questions. And again, don't take anything I say as a fact. Challenge everything. That's the key. Make the effort to prove me wrong. Um, who and when to ask for private money. Now, uh, everybody should take a little note, piece of paper. Uh, we don't, uh, we didn't bring our notepads in tonight. But uh, anybody, what, what do people consider private money? Just an open any question. Uh, anybody, what, what, when somebody says private money, what is institutional money? You don't have to go to Mr. Mack. Don't have to go to Mr. Mack. Any, any other thoughts? Oh, it's either borrowing money from the family or friends. That is a good, that is a good. That's typically what people think of, family, family and friends. Um, the, what's, what's an amount of private money most people would think that they would want to um, look for? Depends on use. Are they buying a car, are they paying off a debt, or are they buying a house? Okay, if they're, if they're investing in real estate, what kind of money, if you're looking for private money, and we're gonna say that private money is not institutional money, for the purpose of this conversation that we're having right now. What, how much money are you looking to borrow? Millions. 100% of what the transaction is going to do. That's a good number to start with, 110%. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can get that, like Bruce? That'll get you in trouble if you borrow 110%. You wanna stay around 70% loan value, or under 65, 70%. Okay, Bruce, Bruce is talking about the amount of leverage that's on the property, and so you're looking to borrow less money than you anticipate the property being worth, so you don't get yourself, you don't outrun your own money. Um, and the typical way that people think about getting private money, what's, as a group, what's the typical way people think about getting private money? I mean, seriously, what? That gets to be the issue, doesn't it? Um, the reason that we wanted to start with that, the Adams Law Firm 
and I apologize that we don't have the dates. I'll get a notepad for everybody to fill these out. Terry Adams uh, is going to put on a, an hour, hour and 20 minute presentation on security law and private money. Uh, he's going to get into the issues that uh, will be much more on the specifics of what you can say and can't say, and when you can say it and can't say it, about private money, or any kind of money where you're looking to raise money for a real estate investment. Uh, Terry's um, very focused on this. Uh, Terry's done a number of secure, securitized transactions, and he's raised plenty of money in his life for different businesses. So this will be a great seminar for everyone to attend. And it, and by having Terry give this seminar, it alleviates my need to even touch on the issues of regulations and law. I'll mention a few things about it. We'll, we'll be able to have some conversations about what you can say and can't say in general. But what I want people to do is that Terry's going to have the presentation, he's going to put it together, and it'll be a situation where everybody should, they can possibly attend. Uh, we'll get emails out to let everybody know when it's going to be. Now, the Longhorn CPA Group, our other sponsor, is they're going to put on a seminar of about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes and they're going to be talking about financial record keeping for other people's money whether you're borrowing 75 percent of value or you're borrowing 110 percent of value how you keep records of other people's investment with you becomes really critical and it's amazing how many people don't even have a chart of accounts for their own business to operate with much less understanding capital accounts and how those capital accounts are going to be balanced or how that money is going to be handled to be sure that it doesn't get mixed into your personal checking account. So the Longhorn CPA group is going to be doing the seminar on record keeping so that you'll have people that you can go to who do it on a regular basis who are very focused on it and you can ask them the specific questions that you need to get the specific answers that make it possible to get private money, and when you get it, you're not going to violate any laws. That's what we want to focus on, doing things right and proper. The, uh, so we're going to take a break here in a few minutes, and during the break, I'll get everybody notepads so we'll get all the paperwork filled out correctly. Now, as I said, uh, this group, is, this seminar is about because of going to a weekend boot camp over in Nashville. And uh, the, the Nashville gurus, the people that are the experts that were there, uh, they gave the reasons why is you don't need to deal with banks and the regulations that banks have. That's the number one reason people talk about private money, best I can tell. That's the number one reason. Uh, in theory, they say, uh, in the meeting, in the presentation, you get better terms when, when you borrow from private money. You can get better rates than if you're borrowing uh, from a bank or some uh, a hard money lender. And uh, as a hard money lender, private money won't squeeze you dry. And or banks that call a loan way right in the middle of you know you've got loans that got rental properties that are stabilized, the bank doesn't want to renew your term loan. So there's all kinds of a thought process that make private money more investor friendly, you might say. The one that everybody talked about in the meeting that they liked the best was that you're in control of the request for the money. Now that's that stack of information. Those are, if you if you Google, if you go to YouTube videos and you Google real estate, um, private money for real estate investing, you'll have a thousand videos show up, and everybody's got similar opinions. But this pretty much summarizes the reasons why you need private money. And they all pretty much say focus the same group of people: young professionals, seasoned professionals, doctors, lawyers. Um, People that are almost retired or about to retire. Somebody, somebody just about to retire from TVA. I always been an engineer with TVA. Somebody that's with Siemens and about to retire from Siemens out of Oak Ridge. Um, people that are need a quick and high rate of return that will be paid for by a real estate transaction that you're going to put them in. And then they do direct mailings into high income areas and you're working in the high income area because high income areas in theory is where people live that have money. Well, of course that's not what we think. <laughs> um, or I think is the case may be. The real estate, and then we talked about this last month in detail. You need to think in terms of three tracks of learning at one time in the real estate <coughs> business. And it's just 
identical to a three-legged stool. It starts with the self-awareness that you want to do something. You need to make a decision to change your life. You've got to, it's not just the ability to say, I'm going to have a big boat or I'm going to have a big house. It's the decision that says, I'm going to do something different tomorrow than I did yesterday. I'm going to do something different tonight than I did this morning. I'm going to make the phone call that might get me embarrassed. I'm going to talk to the person that I do not know and find out what they know. But the self-awareness and the desire to do something creates the opportunity for market knowledge. And market knowledge is really where the strength, the, the strong leg of the stool comes from. Because the market knowledge gives you the ability to make everything else work. The ability to have market knowledge is self-reinforcing of self-awareness. If you've, done, you've decided to do something, you do it, and then you get the market knowledge that says that what you are doing is beneficial. It's, since I haven't been able to lose weight, and Ray has, this is the perfect analogy, you wind, <laughs> you wind up with the thought process that you're going to lose weight, you're telling yourself you're going to lose weight, and you step, the market knowledge is when you step up on the scales and you see that you've lost weight. You have the information, the immediate feedback that says that what you thought you needed to do is what you need to do. You step on the scales and you put on weight, it makes you automatically say, you know, I said I was going to lose weight and I didn't do it. I need to go back and reevaluate what I've been doing over the last few weeks. So it is that thought process that says that the market knowledge lets you reaffirm what your goals have been instantly and immediately. And the market knowledge gives you the ability to begin to do other things that you weren't previously doing. And that's where the financial information, the financial knowledge comes into play. Now, the financial knowledge is not just um, borrow from a bank and borrow for this and say these words. The financial knowledge is an understanding of the structure of how money works, what creates value, and how you create value with the use of money. How you can control assets and significant assets with no money, other than your time and a couple of pieces of paper. And so the financial knowledge is built and come, really comes from the market knowledge of being able to recognize when something has value. Steve was pointing out about some houses that are in the process of being foreclosed and they're being maintained, but they're not for sale yet. So he's identified three properties that are that we know that he knows are going to be on the market. Because they're being the yards are being maintained, we know the freight we I know, they're Freddie Mac houses because Freddie Mac has a program that says that they're, they're not going to market homes, they're not going to listen on the MLS until all the lights work in the house, there's light bulbs in every socket, all the rooms are painted, um, that when you walk in the door, the locks work on the front door. So they're setting a stage for what they want to sell, but there's three homes that are in the process that he already knows about. Now, the, the key part here is that he knows where they are, he knows that they're coming, and to find out how to take that information and create value with it. And that's where you begin to move into the financial knowledge part of the three-legged stool. Now, this process, the following of making the decision to do something, coming to a meeting. Coming to a meeting is no good if you don't take the information that we give, that people in the room share with you. If you don't take that information and use it, in a conversation with somebody else. You have to take what you learn, practice it, speak to other people about it, and find out from them what they have as market knowledge. And you begin to have conversations that you haven't had previously. The thought about moving your life forward is the self-awareness of being able to say, I'm going to invest in real estate. I don't know anything about real estate. But there's, everywhere I look, there's a house. Everywhere I look, there's a farmland. Somebody knows something about real estate. And what we're all wanting to do is share 
the information that we know. But when you're looking for money and you're looking for capital, think through that process. Everyone around you in most neighborhoods is a real estate investor because they bought that house. They don't think of themselves as a real estate investor, but they are. The, uh, what we covered, touching again on last month, the ground rules of money are the same for everybody in the world. It doesn't make any difference if you're an Arab oil baron um, or you're the guy down the street working at a convenience store. The money is handled and determined the same way by everybody. Uh, all money is the same. Every use of money is a negotiation. You will never, ever borrow money, nor will you ever lend money, if that transaction is not a negotiation. Every single time, it's a separate negotiation. Somebody's offering you terms, and you're accepting the terms. You're offering them terms, they're accepting the terms. And how those come together is the matter of the negotiation. The, uh, the conditions for using money are the same for everyone. And these are the ones that create what it costs you to borrow money. The person that's lending the money has limited capital. Even the federal government has run out that they have realized they can't buy more than $85 billion worth of bonds a month. They want to, but they're not going to be able to. So everybody has limited capital and they're choosing what they're going to do with their capital. When you're dealing with private money, the normal problem is not the opportunity cost, which is the economic term you hear so often, um, is the, co the opportunity cost of money. We're going to do this investment instead of this investment, and what can we do over here? With most private investors, fam friends, family, and acquaintances, which is what we're talking about tonight, you're, it's the opportunity loss that's in the future that is the objection that normally is not spoken. They're, they may need the money for uh, a cousin. They may need the money for a child. They may need the money for uh, the spouse's sister who's become a widow. They're not sure what's going to happen in the future. They have a defined amount of money that they can see. Maybe they, can do, they need to do more with it than what they're doing, but do they really have you, are you creating a situation for them in which you can identify so they will tell you what their fear is for the future? Because that's what you really are wanting to begin to think in terms of when you're talking about private money. Again, for tonight's purposes, friends, family, and acquaintances. You're going to wind up wanting them to tell you something that they don't want to tell you. Why they won't lend you money. And that's what you've got to begin to think in terms of as you're having the conversation. Now, risk of inflation, that's certainly something to be concerned about, but in most situations, the person that's going to be loaning you the money is going to be loaning you the money for a year, or two years, or three years. So they may be afraid of inflation, and they want to earn some more money today than they want to learn loan in the uh, then they'll be able to loan over a period of time so they can loan you money for two years, but they can't loan you money for seven. But at the same time, inflation is not a real factor of the money that we're going to be talking about borrowing. The big question is risk of default. That's the one that causes everybody the problem. Everybody is scared of something not working. And we've just been through the worst recession, the worst real estate depression of all time, the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. And so it's something that an entire generation is going to think about. And the final thing about money, no two, no two transactions are ever the same. In the back of the room in the corner there is Chuck Ward. Chuck, hold your hand up, please. Chuck's done, all, by the end of this year, he will have done almost 600 different flips in, in the Knox metro area. Now, that's somebody, yeah, <laughs> I'm living with he, he does know what he's doing, and out of the almost 600 flips in the Knoxville market area, it's unlikely that any two have been the same. They may be almost the same, but if, now that's not true because I think, Chuck, you flipped the same house twice now, haven't you? I've done that two, two times. So there we go. <laughs> I just bought a rental house back then about 10 years ago. So that, that's, that's, that, that is the exception to the rule because that is recycling in the true sense, like exactly. 
because every transaction, they may be almost identical houses, but they're physically not in the same location, they're physically not in the same place. Uh, the time of the transactions are not the same. The future isn't the same. So uh, we're going to... And contrary to popular belief, I work with all realtors. Everywhere. Yes. And not one realtor. I work with all of them. And, we're, and this is an important topic to have because we're going to take a break right here for about a 10-minute break. So everybody can I'll get pads and paper. Everybody take a, a break. The people who haven't met each other meet each other. Uh, anybody that's got a question on subject to property, lease options, Bruce Barrett is sitting right in front of Chuck, and he is the expert. I always defer to Bruce. He is also our direct mail expert. So Bruce, can, Bruce is not like Ray. Bruce can never retire. He's going to have to be here for as long as I'm here. <laughs> because he is the one. So if you've got any questions on direct mail, I'm subject to please catch Bruce at the break. Um, and we'll get started. We'll be uh, back in 10 minutes, please.